but uh, not agape. It does not mean there's no feeling or emotion there, but agape is a different story, as you've been well taught recently. Let me give you an example. When Jesus commanded his disciples to, notice it's a command, to love one another, this is what he said, even as I have loved you, John 13, 34. He was not just telling them to feel warmly about each other, not just a, an emotion or a feeling. Jesus was commanding a certain action on our part in our conduct with one another. We're to emulate him in our dealings one with another as members of his spiritual body, the church, and he being the head of the spiritual body. It's by God's action in dealing with us that we come to understand, to know what real love involves. Now listen to what the scripture has to say. First of all, Paul writing the church at Rome, Romans 5 and verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Then listen to this. Hereby perceive we the love of God. We'll just stop there and say, well, what's he going to say? How can we perceive the love of God? Because he laid down his life for us. And then here's where we make the application to members of the body of Christ. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. 1 John 3 verse 16. Now based upon this, we're told... By John, the apostle of love, in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 18, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Notice how the actions are coupled with the truth. Now this kind of love is agape love. It can be commanded. And it's to pervade all of our relationships, family, Brethren in the Lord. And yes, as taught in Matthew 5, verse 44, we're to even love our enemies. A lot of people not understanding the difference in the Greek words of love and what they really mean. I've said this, and they've had it in mind. Well, I know how much I love my wife or my husband or my parents or my children. How can I love my enemies that way? Our Lord never intended for you to love your enemies that way. He used agape love. Just like God loves a lost world that chose to leave Him and rebel against Him and sin against Him, He even loved us in our sins. What does it mean? I will them good as God defines good. That's why we go out and preach the gospel to them. The gospel being the power of God to save, Romans 1, 16. That's why that we do good unto all men, especially them in the household of faith. Galatians 6.10. So we need to be mindful of the fact that to love our enemies means we simply will them good. You cannot be faithful to Christ in a length of time and not create enemies. You cannot do it. So well, I think I could. You're better than Christ. Christ did not sin, yet he was tempted in every point like as we are. Yet I don't know of a man that had more enemies than he did. In fact, his enemies, those who should have accepted him, his enemies put him to death. Who were they? The very people who had a law given to them and they had it in their hands for 1,500 years, which was to bring them to Christ, Galatians 3 to 4. But they didn't follow it. They had too much going on to satisfy their own desires and he didn't suit them and he just simply ended up being killed by them. They were the ones crying out, crucify him, crucify him. So it's a love that seeks the best for everyone involved, letting the Bible define what is best. And it's demonstrated by taking whatever action, here's that action again, not just goodwill, but goodwill put into action, that's necessary to secure the best for the other person. I mentioned in the class earlier as we started off, we talked about the virus and other things that went on. And we've gone through uh, epidemics and pandemics 
a lot of times in this nation and especially throughout the world in times past. But there was a great cholera epidemic in Nashville in about 1872-73 when the size of that Nashville, Tennessee wasn't but about uh, 26,000 population. And I mentioned David Lipscomb who had his farm 10 miles outside of Nashville. And uh, I did have the numbers and I just can't remember them of how many uh, died from cholera and how many were sickened by it. But uh, what he did, and he wrote these two articles, that's how we know about it. He went in with his buggy, horse-drawn buggy, went into Nashville and uh, helped people get from one place to the other, people who were in the medical business helping. And he was using it to say, now that's Christian. That's Christian love. That sacrificial love. And so it is when it comes to what we're to be because look what Christ did. You want to see love in action? Just look at the life of Christ. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So if we're to be the church that Jesus built, one of the great, if not the great, when we fully understand it, identifying mark of the church is that we must have more love, more biblical love, and not this skewed love that a lot of religious people teach, but it really doesn't come down to what the Bible says. This love can be commanded. Jesus says, if you love me, ye will keep my commandments, ASV 1901. And that's made clear in John 14, verse 15. And John wrote the whole thing on it. First John, he just mentions all sorts of ways that we're to love one another. Remember, our ultimate love, our first love, is to love God with all that we are and all that we have. And the second is likened to it is to love our neighbors or ourselves. But then we're to love our brethren. So in this sermon, we want to consider the love that brethren should have for one another. And I know after all these years of preaching and association with preachers and with working with elders and just simply knowing congregations, there are a host of problems that have developed in congregations because brethren did not love one another. They sought their own designs. I used to tell the, school, the, the students at preacher training school, I said, you may be prepared to meet this false doctrine and you may be prepared to meet that false doctrine. You may be anchored in the truth of what New Testament Christianity really is. You may have a good knowledge of the Bible. And the first church that you go to work with as a preacher has no problem with any of those things. They just hate one another. And uh, over the years, that has been the case. We've got to be honest enough with our own thinking, our own motives, our own purposes with God and what the Bible says to know when we're acting out of a love for God and the doing of His will, love and action, if you please, and when we're really crusading because I want this done my way. And I've seen too many times, personally, besides having heard about it from others, to where such just was not the case. They were simply to be described properly and completely as contentious people. Now, what does it mean to be contentious? Well, we just simply say, if you see a child wanting something and he doesn't get it, and he falls on the floor and kicks and screams and hollers, that's, that's what it means. That's a human child. That's being contentious. But spiritual children of God may not literally fall on the floor. They may too and kick and scream and holler because they did not get their way, but they do it in other ways. Now, you studied, we have, the four different Greek words. We're really going to look at two of them today. The reason why we're going to look at just two of them, when we talk about the love that ought to exist between brothers and sisters in the family of God, is because stergo, which is the love that family members have one for another when they're what they ought to be, never appears by itself in the New Testament, the Greek New Testament, but it's always coupled with something that has to do with the family, the physical family. Then, too, the Greek word eros never appears in the New Testament. Now, the idea is, it's where we get erotic from in our English language. The idea is presented there when fornication and lust of the flesh and so forth is talked about, but the word itself does not appear in the Greek New Testament. So these two primary words we're going to look at when it comes to how we should love one another and what it means is agape and phileo. Both terms are highly significant when discussing the love that brethren are to have for each other. Now we've talked about agape a little bit. 
It often indicates love that is based upon a high regard or appreciation. Do you appreciate your brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you hold them in high regard? They heard the gospel, same gospel you heard, and if they really are Christians from the heart, they obeyed that form of doctrine, Acts 6, 17 and 18, and the Lord added them to the church like he did you. So you're all children of God. It's the demonstration of one's love for another. And that's what we're talking about, love and action. Brethren, I have this kind of regard for each other. Now listen to what John said, or what Jesus said, and John records in John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Now, just thinking casually about that statement, is enough to say that's a lifelong challenge. After all, some people aren't very lovable. That is, oh, wait a minute. That's the whole human race as far as God's concerned because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. We're all separated from Him. The way Jesus sent His death, Romans 6.23. And God loved us even while we were yet sinners. We've heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel. The Lord added us to the church. We're of His spiritual body. He's the head through the New Testament. He teaches us. So I begin to realize I've got to learn people who, to love people who are unlovable. Now think about that for a minute. Now it doesn't mean I'm going to love them like I love my wife and children or husband or father or mother. At least at the beginning. But it means I can treat them in a way that is wholesome and good and wills them the best. Now listen to 1 John 2 in verse number 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light and there's none occasion of stumbling in him. Now that's John writing to Christians. Remember we said it over and over again. Most of the New Testament is written to Christians teaching them how to be faithful. How to live like Christ wants them to live. How to love one another. How to love their fellow man. How to be godly. So we should appreciate each other for who we are. Both God's creatures and certainly God's children. And therefore, demonstrate a high regard for one another and seeking what is best for each other. Now let's say we just stop this sermon here. You've heard it. You've understood what I said. Tell me how from this point forward, if you'd never heard anything like this, in view of what we've seen so far, would there ever be a problem arise on any of our parts that wouldn't be immediately settled? But therefore, when I see that they're not, and in fact, I see people continue to persist in this and persist in that, and all efforts to try to settle it biblically, and that's the only way I want it settled, because it's not settled right unless it's settled biblically, then is that love one for another is it love of God with all we are and have and love for our fellow man and love for the brethren especially is it showing appreciation for the blood bought body of Christ and members in particular a congregation that's characterized by the kind of love we're talking about will do well in the Lord's service because we will respect his word we'll respect his authority we will want each other to be obedient to Jesus Christ but a congregation without this brother to love is going to die. And the reason why is it'll be filled with those who are selfish, self-willed, and they won't have, well, we'll say they have little regard. We'll say they won't have any regard, but little regard for anyone else. I think probably the biggest thing all of us face in being converted to Christ is to get rid of self. And there's a song we sing about all of self, none of thee, some of self, some of thee, none of self, all of thee, indicating the growth and development spiritually to live on earth like Christ lived. Phileo is a love based upon association. It's an affection. There's emotion involved, of course, for someone or something to which we are closely 
related. So you can see how this even connects with family love. For example, James used the term with reference to the world in friendship as it's translated in English. But that's affection. Friendship with the world is enmity or hate with God, James 4.4. 4. In other words, don't be so caught up in the affection for the world because that's going to lead you away from the love of God, the love of your brethren, and the love of studying His Word and putting it into practice. Concerning brethren, the term is combined with brother. And I think uh, maybe it was Eric, I don't remember who it was, who preaching on this brought this out concerning brotherly love, the city of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, putting those two words together is a city of brotherly love. That's what it means. It came from those two Greek terms, Adelphos and uh, Teleo. You put them together, you could fill out Delphia, and you have the city of brotherly love. So this is an affection that we have for a, another brother or sister in Christ based upon the common relationship we have with God and we have with one another. And that common relationship that we have with one another as Christians never sets aside the will of heaven because we have agape love too, you see. And agape love always leads you to obey Christ. So our affections for one another actually is developed on the basis of our love for God and love for His Word and the study of it and the doing of what He said. So in the New Testament, this term regarding the matter of phileo is restricted to fellow Christians. So what is your estimate of your brother or sister in Christ? Well, we're taught to love one another, to have this affection. As Christians, we have a very special relationship with our brethren in Christ. And of course, because we have that special relationship, there's very few Christians in the world, as the Bible defines Christians, this should motivate us to develop great affection for our brothers and sisters in Christ. I can tell you now that if we were literally by the government and by the culture around us and the people of the world hating us simply because we are Christians, you would see how close together we would become because the world hates you. Jesus even told the apostles, the world's going to hate you because you hated me. But he said, don't, don't be afraid because I've overcome the world. And that how to overcome it set right out in the words of the New Testament, the perfect law of liberty. So no wonder James said, uh, whoso looketh at the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. He being not a forgetful hearer, here's this action again, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. James 1.25 So if this affection is not there. We need to really say, I better take a look at my own relationship to God. Both expressions of love, as I've given them here a moment ago, encompass our thoughts and our actions or activity. There's nothing that a congregation should do or think that does not take into account the affection, regard, and action toward those who share common salvation. It is the essential mark of Christians that they consider others first. Folks, that would take care of 99.999% of every problem that's ever arisen in the church. Now, I'm not talking about somebody teaching false doctrine. But I'm talking about our relationship one with another and getting along with one another, as we want to say, when it comes to being what God wants us to be. Now, I want you to look at Agape in Philadelphia, if you want to call it that. And I want you to see how that, those two ideas are combined by the Apostle Peter as he addressed Christians in 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. Now, I'm going to sum that up before I read it, 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. This passage is actually saying, we were born of water of the Spirit when we were baptized. We were born to love. We were born to love. Now, watch what Peter says. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned, which means non-hypocritical love, unfeigned love of the brethren, then, then what are we to do? See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 
That's the reason I say before I read it, we're born to love. But God's got to define that love, and I can't confuse it. I can't corrupt it. Well, who do I have as an example? Well, it's that same Peter that said you have as an example a pattern to follow Jesus Christ. The world is filled with hatred, with envy, with grudges, with greed, with covetousness, with strife, with vengeance. If there's anything that proves that, then just look at what's going on over toilet paper in this situation right here. I mean, isn't that ridiculous? But here are grown people, some of them my age, others mature, and they, and they have so much selfishness. That's mine, mine, mine. I'll knock you in the head if you even look at it. And yet here we are as the children of the living God. We're walking in the light as he is the light, having fellowship one with another, with the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleansing us from all sin, verse John 1, 7. How do we deal with that kind of thing? And how do we deal with one another in the day-to-day -day operations of the church? So these things are to be put far from us, hatred, envy, greed, etc. When one obeys the gospel, he enters a new relationship with God and fellow believers. That's why Paul said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, all things are become new. This new relationship with others is characterized by, as I said earlier, unhypocritical brotherly love and fervent love. Fervent love means a feverish love, an intense love for each other, for your brothers and sisters of the Lord. This means that the affection we express toward each other must be genuine. And the demonstrations of our love must be with fervor and zeal. We actually do care for one another and we prove it by our actions, each esteeming others better than themselves. We should be eager to show our love and affection, especially for fellow believers. When problems arise in the church, there ought to be a switch clicked in our minds. This is the time for me to show I'm ready to agree. I'm ready to give in. I'm ready to humble. I'm not ready to ride my horse to get in my way to blow it all out. Now, I'm not. Don't confuse that with standing for the truth. Don't confuse that at all. Because look at Paul, who wrote the great chapter on agape love in 1 Corinthians 13. He's the one who withstood a fellow apostle, Peter, to the face. And he says of Peter, he was to be blamed. Blamed for what? He transgressed God's law in that matter. So don't confuse that with compromising the truth. But do show in matters of, we're all human beings, aren't we, with the same frailties. It does show that we're interested in settling matters, not keeping them going. Have you ever seen somebody, maybe a child, pick at a mosquito bite? until it develops into a sore. Well, I'm sure you've seen something like that. Well, brethren sometimes prove their lack of affection one for another and their lack of esteeming others better than themselves because there'll be a real a legitimate problem arise. Man, it be a big deal. But rather than you say, okay, let's just get over this and go on, they pick at it. They pick at it until it becomes no telling what. It's a natural outcome of being born again by the Word of God to be filled with the agape love and the brotherly love. That has to be added to our lives. So our will has to be involved in this. Anything pertaining to Christianity has to do with our willing it to be so. You obey the gospel because you will to obey the gospel. You worship God in spirit and in truth this morning in the acts of worship because you will to do it that way. You're in submission to the will of Christ as you know the word of Christ. That's the only place his will is manifest. And this loving one another is a command of Christ. It's not something you can take or leave. He said you love one another. Thus I must will to do it. You may not like it. I don't think Christ liked being nailed to that cross either. Oh, but that's how he showed his love for us. This is essential to unity. We've talked about the unity of the church. We've looked at God's platform for unity in Ephesians 4 and the seven planks in God's platform and all that's so important. But among the church, those who are real Christians, this brotherly love is essential to the oneness that God intended. We often stress, and rightly so, Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, and the truth of it. 
just as essential to unity as the love we must have one for another. We must work on it. After all, love or lack thereof is the driving motivation behind our actions toward each other. I mean, what is there in me that makes me treat you like I do treat you? Or the way you treat others? Is it something you can't help? You just, you know, those folks fighting on toilet paper, could they help that? Could they have just said, you, you take it. I'll find something somewhere else. But that's the world, you see. Why should that characterize us? It doesn't have to be just over this particular emergency that's in the land. Just day-to-day -day activity. And above all, seen in the families of members of the church. If we have this kind of love, then we will be, this is what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Now, some people will read that and say, well, then how could Paul withstand Peter to the face? Because it's two different things, brethren. You can't let a brother engage in sin and say, I love him so much. I have so much brotherly love for him. I can't point the sin out to him. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13 by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's part of the will of Christ. But he certainly withstood Peter in the face because he was to be blamed. He wrote 1 Corinthians, as we have it, that epistle, to the church in Corinth because they were making such a mess of a whole lot of things in violation of God's will. I think it's interesting that 1 Corinthians 13 on agape love is found in such a letter to a church in as big a mess as the church at Corinth was in. Unity cannot exist long without these attitudes. Apostle Paul, giving the keys to unity and success as servants of God, faithful servants of God, expressed well the same concept to the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. He said, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. If we could learn that, we'd be so much better off. But, in contrast, in other words, to that, in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things. Boy, think about how that would stop things that's been going on in the nation. But every man also on the things of others. The gospel of Jesus Christ will change people if they will simply believe it and obey it and it's seen in their actions. And we will know what it is to love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ if we'll put these things into practice. I watched too long too many people just tear up things. Very first local work I was in, a man was asked to step down, and rightly so, as an elder. And when some of the people went out to visit with him, his first comment was, prove they were right. I ought to come down there and just tear that church up. And yet he had been serving as an elder. Now what was he thinking about? Esteeming others better than himself? No. He was thinking about, I can't get my way. And if I can't get my way, you remember what Hitler said ought to be done to Germany when he re really realized that it was all going down? They don't deserve anything left. Burn it all up. That was his attitude. So when you read what's said here in these scriptures in Philippians 2, 1 through 4, this conveys the kind of actions and thoughts we should have in our relationship with each other. The apostle then appeals to the example of Christ who denied himself, and we won't read that in Philippians 2, 5 through 8, but the very point is he gave up all that it means to be the second person of the Godhead, to come into a world he made. Without him was not anything made that was made, John said. And yet man had corrupted this world. But he came into the corrupt world, his world that man corrupted, and lived in it, being tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin, showing us how to live in it. Now, have you ever done something that you were pleased with, you worked hard on it, and yet it was taken and abused and torn up because people didn't appreciate it? Well, that's what happened, in effect, when God created the world. 
when Adam and Eve were put in the garden. They didn't appreciate it. And man's been that way all along. What's our point? If Jesus being God emptied himself in complete humility and service for others, how much more should we, the lowly creatures, empty ourselves in order to love and serve each other? Imagine if we all had the attitudes that we've looked at here. Will we see strife, personality divisions, hatred and contentions in local churches? No, we wouldn't. We would not. And if there was any of that ever rear its head, it would be settled rather quickly. Would bitterness ever raise its ugly head to tear brethren apart? I don't believe it would because I believe the Bible to be true. And I know it wouldn't. And when you have to deal with brethren like that, it's like dealing with unruly children. Don't you know all these things already? You've been a member of the church for years. What has happened? And you realize then they may have been filling a pew, but they hadn't really changed from what the world's like. They're still very worldly. And that's a shame. Jesus said that others will know that we are his disciples by the love we have one for another. John 13, 34 through 35. We need to think about this before we get tied up in all the kinds of bitter wrangling that so many people get into. I want to read some scriptures and the lesson will be yours. The apostle John wrote, He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. There's none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. 1 John 2, 10 through 11. He also wrote, We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. 1 John 3, 14 through 15. So I don't know how you express any plainer than these passages do to show the importance of love, proper love, scriptural love, brotherly love that should exist in every member of the church. We should respect the way the Lord's ordered the church, organized it, the worship of the church, the items of worship, and how we deal one with another. It's a matter of the will. It just simply comes down to that. And the Lord closes book of Revelation by saying whosoever will. And that will be the case in growing up in Christ in putting these things into practice. Whosoever will. There couldn't be a final judgment if I wasn't responsible for my actions. So when it comes to the day that we come before the Lord to give an account of the deed done in the body whether good or bad, can we say that we've tried with all our might to love our brethren like these passages teach and so do others and Jesus left an example how to do it? This is what we need because it will lead us to love the truth. It will lead us to love God with all we are and all we have. It will lead us to love our neighbors ourselves. It will cause us to be concerned to learn the Bible, to preach it to others and to contend for the faith once for all to live to the saints. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, we beg of you to do that this morning by believing that Christ is the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of your sin. As a child of God, if you've committed sin, we urge you to repent of it. Pray God for forgiveness as you confess those sins. And do so now while you have the opportunity as we stand and sing.